and we'll need that sort of that sort of money if we're going to go and really put a dent in carbon in the construction sector so what's the best way of doing that and let's get creative with humans that sit in bigger organizations and smaller organizations to make something work one thing that's been a constant on this podcast is the fact that all of our guests are the kind of people that are actually doing something they care about. And you'll hear a lot about that on this episode. When you hear the word decarbonisation, it's easy to be flippant about what's being discussed. It is one of the buzzwords in construction. And it's easy to say, harder to do. Especially if you're a large organisation built on traditional ways of working with a diverse supply chain and a reliance on contracting out a lot of the work that is required. But how does the sector navigate the path from mere and sometimes overinflated environmental claims to genuine, effective strategies that change the way in which construction goes about its business? To understand this and gain an insight into the current state of play, we'll look to shed some light on what it truly takes to construct buildings with minimal environmental impact or at least look to sustainable methods of building that are less reliant on the planet's finite resources. It's often a challenge to persuade skeptics that sustainability isn't just the latest buzzword. We'll delve into the art of substantiating the case for sustainable construction and long-term benefits it can bring and explore whether it's feasible to usher in significant change in an industry known for its resistance to innovation. So, where do we start? Innovating new products, reimagining design, educating the workforce, upgrading equipment, streamlining logistics, tackling the existing building stock, or embracing novel construction methods. It's a long list, and there may not be one simple answer, one universal agreed-upon solution. Let's see where we get to, shall we? Our guest today is Tom Robinson, founder of Adaptivate, with a vision to consolidate the company as the world's leader in the development and global deployment of carbon negative building products. A former builder, a planet centric system thinker, and, in, and an industrialist whose belief is that industrial businesses can do both planetary good and economically well. But how did he get to this point? Oddly enough, it was the book, Let My People Go Surfing, The Education of a Reluctant Businessman, by the Patagonia founder, Yvonne Schwinard. Apologies for the pronunciation there. Uh, which Tom was reading while embracing a simple, minimal, and ecological way of living and traveling the world. Sounds pretty idyllic to me. Uh, Tom began his working life as an on-site builder and plasterer before studying for a master's in sustainable architecture. And through his thesis, Tom developed what is known as Breatherboard, a carbon negative alternative to plasterboard, followed by other products such as Breather Plaster. I'm sure we'll touch upon them in a little bit. And now the pinnacle of his career being inducted into the construction disrupted hall of fame. Tom, I'm afraid it's all downhill from here. Welcome. <laughs> and have I missed anything from that intro? No, Peter, as always, a pleasure to say uh, share space with you. Thanks for asking me on. Uh, I really admire your unique energy that you put out into our industry. So it's nice to be uh, nice to share some space with you, mate. Thank you. Thank you. Likewise. Likewise. So let's let's dive into this. And there's a couple of stats I'm going to throw your way before we get into any kind of dialogue here. Uh, there was a study commissioned by the European Union found that about 53% of green claims, that's over half, uh, on products yeah. and services make vague, misleading or unfounded claims. 40% have absolutely no supporting evidence. Wowzers. And it's not just the small organizations that are trying to blag this. Uh, HSBC, Quorn, Unilever, they've been caught flying the false green flag. If we focus yeah. solely on construction and the wider built environment here, it accounts for about 38% of global carbon emissions. So with those big numbers in mind and narrowing this down to construction, how do we transition 
from an industry aw- awash with fake greenery, which we kind of know it is, to one that can reduce its emissions to which it is pluming a lot into the environment at this moment in time? Yeah, thanks for the easy question to start off with, Peter. That's really that's really <laughs> good of you. Um, I'm glad we had a nice warm up. Um, yeah. Like it, it's a pretty big, it's a pretty big problem, isn't it? When when people that are kind of inadvertently setting the standards are not necessarily following through through with that and, and leading by example. Mm. Um, yeah, greenwashing, carbon reduction. How does our industry transition through this? I think, as with all, un, like rapidly growing. So what, what, what we've got really here, OK, is we've got where construction meets carbon and mm-hmm. then we've kind of got capitalist structures and standard structures and certification structures that sit under, un, underneath that kind of underpinning it all. But this this, you know, and this is where Adaptivate sits is, is, is this kind of we're a carbon business that operates in construction products. Right. So we're, we're, we're this is what we get out of bed for, really, uh, or certainly one of the things. I think when you step back from the detail that we are the carbon markets and construction's role in that is a is a fast growing, uh, highly dynamic um, sort of market, particularly the carbon market. Mm. How construction plays in that is slow, typically in the construction industry. But when you've got something that's kind of rapidly you know rapidly developing it's quite unregulated we haven't got a we haven't got a regulation body for this that sits across the world yet uh i i don't think really there's the stuff that happens in with regards to carbon in europe and there's different principles and then there's epds and or environmental product declarations or life cycle assessments but um i think with that you you have you have as it as it emerges this this gray area Hmm. and um particularly in our industry i think uh that gray area is increasingly becoming black and white with things like the introduction of epds and the increased awareness of environmental product declarations or life cycle assessments you know uh an epd is just one measurement um you know one one tool but life cycle assessments broadly and I think um, also the development of whole whole life cycle assessment. So not just from the cradle to the factory gate, but looking at it in in its whole uh, the cycle of the whole the material through its whole life, um, and then having that holistic view of of the imprint of that thing and the production of it in that place for that market and that waste stream uh, and the impact that, that has on the planet uh, holistically. I think is helping uh, and the move from EPD 15804 from A1 to A2 is also interesting. And I think people are increasingly understanding the potential of that. That's on a product point of view. Then we've got to transfer that into whole building perspective. And there's some great organizations like Materials 2050, um, One Click, LCA One Click, you know, those, those sorts of organizations fronted by Arab, UK Green Building Council, those people that are really leading mm. by that. Not sure how well the government are doing leading that. Uh, they seem to be meandering a little bit at the moment, but maybe we'll get into that in a bit more detail in a minute. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think now's an opportune time to just dig a little deeper into Adaptivate it, it, itself. Uh, yeah. I, I think it's it's a really cool story to tell, of which I yeah. did a little bit of of the intro. So what I'd like you to do is fill in the blanks by way of what what is adaptivate now what are you doing now yeah so so uh, essentially you know adaptivate's purpose uh is to take co2 out of the atmosphere or to stop it from going into the atmosphere and put it into and put carbon into building materials that everyone can use and specify that are made on industrial processes uh for international deployment um we're founded to be a business that does good first and foremost by the planet's point of view and do well from an economic point of view as a byproduct of doing good and we do this on an industrial scale to produce commodity alternative commodity products 
uh, which is wallboard and wallboard plasters and 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 what and, and plaster systems is our is our vehicle for this. Um, and we do this on you know we're, we we do this on an international scale, uh, or, or beginning to do this on an international scale. Um, so yeah, that's really really carbon capture and utilization into building materials is essentially what we do in a nutshell. And 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 that's the thing I, I really like about how you've developed the organization and, and the way it's, it's run and and your focus, you know, you've got your, your huge big ambitions and then you've, you, you scale it back onto what's happening now, but you, you, you're looking at two things, you know, you're looking at the planet and you're looking at, at, at profit as, as well, because that's what businesses yeah. are, are there to do. You know, that's their main focus. And there's not many organizations and they said get away with it, but that isn't <laughs> true. There's not many organizations that are as bold and brash to say, yeah, we are looking to make some some money, but we're going to do it in the way that we want to and that is right yeah. for us to do. You know, it's either one or the other, but but you're combining yeah. the two and 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 rightly so. And I think that's where greenwashing gets wrapped onto the capitalist structures. You know, it's like, well, we're set up to make money, and then we're going to do this greenwashing on top because it's kind of it's a kind of we're you know making a purse out of sales here or whatever it is. You know that kind of uh, <laughs> you know whereas whereas here. You know, inspired by the the, the 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 guy that you said at the start. You know, Yvonne Chouinard. When I was a dirt bag, living in a van, climbing and surfing. You know, up that up and down the uh, American and Canadian coast. I didn't want to be part of the capitalist structure. You know, yeah. I was inspired by Yvonne Chouinard, the founder of Patagonia, to actually think about how businesses can be a force for good and do well as a byproduct. And then fast forward a few years, you know, and setting up a building company on a small scale, stone masonry, plastering, dry lining, that sort of thing. I sort of saw this opportunity to really think about how we could change that industry. And Adaptivate is a massive experiment um, to be able to be a business as a force for good as well as doing well, because it's about the redressing of the capital and the carbon structures. You know, mm. um, systemically, we've got to still have businesses. That's we, we're not going to. That system's not going <laughs> to. Probably not going to break any time in the next year or two, right? Although maybe it is, and and it's a free for all, and there's a whole heap of opportunity there, but uh, mm -hmm. as well as challenges. But you know, we've got to operate in the structures that we 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 have. But but we need to make sure that they become aligned with the planetary systems as well. And we're focused on that on an industrial foundation industry scale for international deployment. And I think that's a pretty systemically, systemically kind of cool place to be and, and mm. focus our energies and, and shine a beacon for, for other people to help us transition it. We're not going to do it by ourselves by any means. So, so so within within the construction industry there's there's so many different sectors and, and so many components that, yeah. that make up a, a build. Um even if you you start to to narrow those down into um, bigger sections, there's still things like you know the, the roofs, the beams, the walls, the floors, the foundations, sure. and and just looking at one of these, they have lots of rules, lots of regulations, lots of compliances and standards to consider. Um, yeah. So it's quite tricky to kind of navigate around these on a bigger scale, which is why you're focusing on one one particular area. But there must yeah. be some fundamental rules that that can assist with low carbon construction in general. So, in 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 your own words, what would be the key principles and practices for low carbon construction that we need to be aware of? Yeah. So, I think if we look at low carbon construction, we need um, one of the main things that we talk about here in in our business as people, as a as teams, as business, and as an industry is. Um, Kind of efficacy and transparency, uh, genuineness. Um, to be able to get to low carbon construction or net zero in utopia, or indeed carbon negative in absolute mega utopia, you know, we need a genuine, some people might say in big corporate world, you know, science based targets. We need a genuine understanding and shared understanding of where we need to get to and how we're going to get there and what good looks like. And and mm. and 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 that's supported by genuine, the second point, standards. 
Yeah. So so we need to have an, a, 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 a worldwide understanding of what a good standard looks like for the way we build or the way that we account for carbon or the material flows. And that's and that's happening with 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 either ISO standards or European norms and, 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 and those sorts of things. Um, and then I think really it's about industrialization. Um, I think the market is clearly ready for this stuff and regulation is 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 incoming. It's a little bit slow, but it is incoming. And when you get the transparency and genuineness combined with genuine standards and you've got the industrialization of the of the solutions to be able to give to the market and they're put into systems on an international scale. I think that's a really powerful um, combination. And I think this all needs to be underpinned by things like, particularly in construction, EPDs. And that can be EPDs for products. And that can be, you know, um, EPDs for buildings. That can be EPDs for infrastructure. And those sorts, that system thinking about whole system, whether the system's a building or the system's a partition or the system's a road network. You know that whole system approach is is really really important and and complex but hey we're doing pretty complex things here you know you, you branch into mm -hmm. ai and you bring ai into carbon i mean that's a really cool area maybe we'll get into some trends earlier but later but um you know i think it's really underpinned by those three things and then epds right so so you, you've hit you've hit on something there that they're kind of broader scale elements and on a previous podcast with fiona graham from pay apps we were talking about how construction along with agriculture and mining uh, is quite yeah. traditional and, and reluctant to change and you've, you've probably seen that firsthand you know being on the tools and all that kind of yeah. stuff so when it comes to decarbonization it may feel like we're pushing a very heavy lump of coal up a really smoky hill is is it even possible on the scales we're talking about? I mean, the obvious answer is yeah, because anything's <laughs> possible when you put the right mm. you know, things in place. I think, you know, um, we've evolved in, you know, thousands and, and millions of years to, to, to be the form of the species we are now. And the species is not a a point in, in is, is a is a point in time but it continues to evolve um mm -hmm. i mean uh, we have to to maintain this species presence on on this spherical object in a vacuum um called space um as we know it so some some things you know we are hurtling towards a, a, a kind of existential challenge in what time frame we don't know and that's the that's the ticking time bomb we don't really know about. So, you know, I mean, when you have a ticking time bomb, you know, oh, I've got an hour left. You know, you need to pace towards it. You know, you can set your pace and go mm -hmm. for it. But that's sort of science is saying blah, blah and blah. And so there's no urgency. Where is the urgency? Tell me that climate change is a problem or resource threats are, are a problem or, you know, look what happened in COVID. So I think I think um, I think it is possible on what time frame. Well, let's start with 2050. Governments have signed up to be net zero by 2050. So, OK, so we've got a time. We've got a time frame as a long stop date here. Uh, that is a regulationary kind of um, uh, target, as you would set in your business. I've got a target to hit blah, blah, blah. OK, so to do that, what do I need to do? And OK, the system's pretty big because it's cross sector, cross country, cross globe, you know, around the world. Mm. From what I see from sitting down with some of the leaders of the biggest businesses in the construction industry, both in a product production point of view, architectural point of view, asset owner point of view, carbon is the first thing they talk about hmm. pretty much most of the time. And what's starting to happen is that people are, from a regulatory point of view, understanding the cost that carbon is going to give them in the future, right? So then they're starting to make decisions because it's based on cost. It's now not just a nice thing to do with this notional time thing in the future. Well, I'm not really bothered about it. Um, it's now actually a thing which is actually, I can start to see at points where it's gonna in, it actually have a bottom line effect on my business. If I build a building with a thousand kilograms of CO2 per square meter, then actually there may be a tax on that now. 
So then there's a fiscal implication on the business. And actually, in some of the more progressive businesses, um, there are actually people in those businesses now that are fiscally incentive, incentivized in their pay packets with reducing carbon. And now we start to have momentum. Now, whichever yeah. industry you are in, that's a massive incentive for the people that are actually doing business, making procurement decisions, specifying products, whatever. So it's really interesting. So I think it's absolutely achievable, um, but it's backed up by the efficacy and the transparency, the standardization, the industrialization, as I said before. Um, and I'm super curious about how we can play a part in, in being part of that transition. It's a super exciting time to think mm. about how we can do it. 10 years ago, there was hardly any EVs and they went about, I don't know, 50 miles? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, I mean, like we, we'll we'll be making we'll be making lower carbon buildings, significantly lower carbon buildings in ten years' time. There's no doubt mm. about it. Um, yeah, there's yeah. there's loads of things. Slight tangent, but there's loads of things that I'm noticing at the moment coming out, and and the, the going back say 15, 20 years, and it's kind of this vision of the future. And and the most recent one, I, I can't remember what it was, but I think it was a map of Africa. And then there was two people by the side of it talking. And it was something like, this could be the future where we can speak on a global scale and you can be in one country and I can be on a, in another yeah. and we can chat. Isn't that radical? And it was, yeah, yeah. And 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 now we almost, if if I can't speak to somebody in America in 15 minutes time, face yeah. to like face to face if you yeah, like face, yeah. it's a bit weird <laughs> um you know and, and like you said that is it's such a short span of time for things to happen and now we look back and we think that's just ridiculous that we didn't think that was possible i think the construction industry is a bit slower to change than normal right but i mean mm. you know as a species we've we've got to change because we can't go through the growth that is projected in terms of the people on the planet and the additional resources that are going to need to be able to supply to those people and their increased expectations of standards of living and the increased carbon emissions that that's going to drive and the effect on the climate. And, 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 you know, and we're getting into kind of feedback loops, you know, that are going to exponentially affect these people that operate on, on this spherical object that moves through space. You know, it's, it, it is going to, it's going to affect my children quite significantly. They'll be living in a different world. But I think there's a really exciting opportunity here to think about how we did and, and learnings from COVID were really significant. Hey, how we can come together as one species to be able to kind of um, adapt to uh, innovate. I mean, someone should make a business name about adaptation and innovation, shouldn't they? Like put it together. <laughs> um, Never gonna but, work. you know, like it's amazing how a species can come together to adapt towards a, a challenge. It's just on what time frame do we need to do it? COVID was like tomorrow. Climate change is like. 30 years, 40 years. Well, it's actually closer than that, really, isn't it? Um, so I think it's interesting as we as we navigate this as a species and how it, how the governments do and, and how science backs it up. And I don't really subscribe. It's difficult because governments don't do anything until corporates do, do, do something and corporates don't do something until consumers do something. Consumers don't do something until the governments do something. And we're sort of <laughs> caught, in, caught in this kind of, you know, inertia, this moment of inertia. And it's like, well... As adaptivators, we're just going to get on and do it. And we can see the business case <laughs> and the actual case kind of emerging and strengthening. So it's like, come on, who wants to come with us, you know? I just want one, one second. I think, oh, well, just, just give me, this is going to be terrible for podcasts, by the way. But have you got a, a sample of breather board? Oh, you're. <laughs> no, no, I haven't, but I've got this though. I, oh, I dropped it. There you go. Uh, Look at that. There you go, mate. That's your, uh, your cape, as you call it, isn't it? Absolutely. My adaptivate cape. I am an adaptivator because I have the T-shirt. That was great. Yeah. Great podcast in that. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so, yeah. So on on, on that point, you, you mentioned cost and price being a, a, a almost a catalyst, if you like, uh, an, a, an incentive. But where can where can we start? You know, is it? I don't mean individually, I mean more as, as, as an industry. Is it product? Is it design? Is it people, equipment, logistics, um, current stock, new methods? New st where, where are the possibilities to start to, to, to gain some traction, if you like, for this? Um, I mean, my obvious answer is it's an integrated system. Um, and so all of those things connected is really 
if you can make 1% gains in all of those areas, you don't have to get to what perfect looks like straight away. But if you can make an incremental gain in in a 1% gain in each one of those areas, then you're doing, you, the, the sum of those 1% gains are far more than just the sum of the ones, mm. right? And um, we've got a real mantra uh, as adaptivators, which is it's those 1%ers that really get us where we're going. You know, yeah. and it's sort of you know outfail the competition. It's our it's our privilege to fe- you know to kind of experiment and learn what doesn't work and get to what works as quickly as possible. Um, and I think you know we've got to take calculated risk in the industry, right? I mean, you know, we can't we can't can't be high risk. That's that's and and we we all need to work to mitigate risk. But we need to win. We get need to get those one percent. I think um, I think the first thing that everyone can do in our industry is just become more aware hmm. um be be curious yeah be be curious about how you might be able to improve the reduction of water in your building or how you might be able to get a cool cpd from a progressive company or thinker or report writer you know into your team to be able to get those bright minds thinking a bit more i think if we can just be curious and be open to what the future could hold um i think that's a really powerful thing that as an industry could really serve us um i mean there's a load of things that we could (laughs) talk about like there's no silver bullets right mate i don't think there's i don't think there's any silver bullets you know um Concrete is obviously a massive one, but the risk attached to putting pouring concrete on site, you know, with a with a is is massive. So we're like we're like five to ten years away from that being kind of really viable. But it is a big one, like it's a big silver mm. bullet. It's the second most used thing on the world in the world, apart from water. Uh, and by the way, it's got a lot of water in it. Um, <laughs> but you know, I think it's I think it's just really being curious about how you and your ecosystem that you work in or or live in can 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 improve and if we all can do that then 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 we'll get there it's certainly a good way to start at any road yeah absolutely so we we were talking about um pricing incentives for for individuals um, yeah but I read a stat from the British Assessment Bureau and they said that there is little to no additional cost to building in a green or sustainable way, right? And I thought, well, okay, that's that's surprising. Um, and, and then they went on to say, with, with a life cycle saving of about 20% of the total construction costs. So long-term, yeah. there is probably cost savings. Where are these cost savings coming from? I know it sounds like a simplistic question, but it'd be good to just explore that a little bit. Yeah, so so there's a couple, this is a, uh, this is a dynamic model approach. So what mm. when we talk about carbon and cost, typically as people in our industry, we are programmed to think about what it, the value is today based on the cost today and the price today and the value today. When we look at industries, um, uh, you know, solar is a good example. EV is a good example. You start at a high price, but then and and low market volume. But then uh, your price comes down and your market value increases. And and then you get to, you know, uh, an inflection point. And 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 the and the market value uh, the market penetration goes up, yeah, and mm-hmm. the cost comes down, and, and and you know the kind of gig that I'm on about. So, um, what, what? So so are we talking about today? Yeah, and 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 what are the? You know, name me another carbon negative building material you can put in the building today on a, on a on a big scale. If you were fitting out a big forty story you know building in in central London, name me a carbon negative product. I don't think there are any. There might be a carpet mm. tile. You know, from interface maybe there's not a whole heap of selection out there right so what we're interested in having is conversations with people that want to transition and so let's talk about the market of three years or five years or six years now let's imagine that situation and us as kind of thinkers in this space we're always imagining not the market of today necessarily we're thinking about the market of five or six years time because okay. it takes two years to build a facility at least 
We're talking about heavy industry here, foundation industry. Mm -hmm. You've got to find the capital. You've got to build the business model. You got Even if you have got the capital, you've got two years to build something, right? You've got to build a building. You've got to build a plant. You've got to get operational. This is heavy stuff. And this is the challenge with the carbon industry. OK, so actually what we're then looking at is a market of two or three years time. Now, what's going to let's talk, look at some assumptions based on that. The cost of carbon emissions, either as a producer of things or as a builder of buildings, the cost of carbon will have gone up. So the direct cost on your bottom line of carbon will be more impactful to your business case. Therefore, it will be squeezing your margins, whatever they look like. The, the other thing is, is that the prevalence of solutions in the market that tangibly reduce carbon for those people that have an increasing pressure are limited. OK, so now there's a race, as we are seeing, for low carbon and carbon neutral and carbon negative solutions. So then the because there's a low volume of them and there's a high demand for them, the price in comparison to the, the commodity products, frankly, is academic. Mm. And then what we start to see is, oh, OK, well, there's only uh, I, I'm only producing three million meters squared, uh, three, me three million meters squared. Um, from my production facility in this notional point in time, three years uh, forward. Uh, well, OK, I've got purchase orders at the moment for seven million uh, meters squared. I I'm sorry, I can't sell it all to you. Know, we aren't producing enough. Yeah, well, it's just not, this is mm -hmm. not a, an app that we can just turn the, the tap on overnight. You know, it's not just more people. We've got to build the infrastructure. We've got to get the capital, the right risk profile or or our partners got have got to or. And, and step away from Adaptivate for a minute. Let's just look at whoever it is. So, so then what we're talking about is about this perceived cost and value of these assets or, or, or solutions, whatever they might be, in the market of the future. And that, for people in our industry today, is really hard for them to get their heads around. But what we really enjoy talking about is, is partnerships that do get their head around that. And there are okay. some really cool, you know, partners that we've 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 worked with that do get their head around that. And there's some exciting exciting announcements coming up in the next few months from from us about those partnerships. Fantastic! I look forward look forward to hear hearing oh, that. that makes sense. Um, yeah, like you know. Yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely. And, and the thing is that it, it's not, and and we've said this throughout. It's it's there's no silver bullet. Bullet. It, it's not black and white as uh, as yet. So in terms of where does that cost saving come from it's not as simple as we well, do this and you do that and you get this and you save that it's there's 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 many variables and and lots of different well, components that that go into that one absolutely and frankly there's uh, no there's very few solutions available today that i can actually mm. that someone can sell to you to, to be honest yeah, with yeah. you mate there's, there's, there's nothing really so then it's all about a conversation in the future and quite often they're interdependent chicken and egg Right. <laughs> so a lot of these low carbon solutions, because the, the, the bigger industries are not uh, the bigger, com the uh, bigger companies have not really developed those solutions. Right. So it's like it's businesses like ours that are in coming into the market where mm. whereby we're saying, OK, so let's imagine a situation in two or three years time. And let's look at that and what the price of everything looks like in comparison to the incumbent or the commodity. And, and let's look at the price of carbon and what that might cost you. And, and let's, you know. So it's a bit more, I'm not dodging the the, the the question, but ultimately our solutions will be the same price as commodities in the future. Absolutely. When that is, probably within five to seven years, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. But, but getting there is 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 the uh, is the interesting route. Yeah, yeah, for, for sure. One one thing that kind of strikes me with that when it comes to uh, commoditization as, as 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 such and like you say we're, we're, we're years away from that from from what you create and, and, and produce and where you're going is that when it starts to become a, a commodity and, and price is very competitive then it starts to or potentially particularly within construction we view mm -hmm. the lowest cost as the cost we want because it's cheaper and there's more profit in it is there a potential or is there the concern or worry that when it starts to become commoditized, bigger organizations can get involved and they, and they're probably doing it already a bit, but they start to bring products to the market that aren't as carbon negative, carbon neutral, environmentally friendly, but they're cheaper and they look to certain people they look similar or to have those environmental credentials where they don't really is that a possibility because that that's a bit of a worry there really 
It's a possibility, of course, but I think it comes back to my, my previous points about what the key principles are around low carbon construction. And it's about the transparency of yeah. that and the standardization of that. And that's done through EPDs and central regulation. So I don't yeah. think we've got a situation where insert big global building product uh, company uh, of, of the ones that will will pop into your head instantly will be will be will be, you know, um, able to get away with that um mm. because uh it won't fly in an epd you know an epd is an independent assessment now some companies play tunes on that you know we look at waste in different ways or how much waste has actually gone out maybe it affects the carbon levels or you know there are yeah. tunes that are played on epds um so then it comes back to transparency and efficacy but mm. um you know, I I think I think that's I think that is 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 a good is a good standard. You know, standardization is important. And when people as procurement, the big procurers, you know, real estate owners, big architects, those contractors, they're ver they're very they're very literate. They're re no, they're increased. Hmm, their literacy is increasing in this area, and mm -hmm. they're the real decision makers. Um, mm -hmm. but I, I, I sort of, I feel like it's going in the right way, which is also why I said as well, what's the one thing that we can all do? Just be curious and get more literate, you know? Yeah. Cause then we make better decisions. And if we all can make better decisions, then we're going in the right direction. For, for sure. So sticking on that decision makers, decisions and going in the right direction, yeah, you mentioned um, 2050 and uh, net zero cutting emissions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You gonna start talking about my and, retirement? And... That sounds like a long <laughs> time. I'm very tired by then. Uh, absolutely. Well, th th this th that in itself kind of. Well, I'll come on to that in a second. Not your retirement, obviously, but where the, where this is leading. <laughs> um, but other. So you've got this net zero thing that the government is yep. focused on. You've got other initiatives, UK Energy Sustainability Policy, Environmental Improvement yep. Plan, and the Sustainability yep. Development Management Plan. And there's many yep. others that have come and gone that are more focused on homeowners, for for example, um, terrible yep. boiler replacement schemes and stuff that we're just never going to work in a million years. Um, yep. But that's, that's by the by. So... Do you think the government is <laughs> is doing enough right now, um, or is there a better way to help and support the industry? Our, our government. Let's start with our government's doing enough. Uh, majority of governments have signed up to be net zero by twenty fifty. Um, we're going to tread a path towards that, where we, you know. Um, either hit those key milestones or don't hit those key milestones. I'm surprised, uh, I'm consistently surprised by when I sit round tables with biggest building product manufacturers in the world and their 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 carbon zero roadmaps are, um, let's just say, uh, increasing in detail of, <laughs> of how they're going to get there. They've said they're going to get there, It's but not quite sure how all that hangs together. And I think governments are a little bit the same. If we actually just look at the UK government, for, or the UK, actually, the UK, mm. we're actually doing better than a lot of other countries. One of the better ones in, in the world. Is it good enough? No. Is it a reason to take the foot off the gas? Absolutely not. Is this a missed opportunity to take all this bright information that's come out of our universities and then commercialise it at a time where we are post-Brexit, in a really challenging economic situation where actually there isn't a trade-off between green and growth. You can do both things really well and you could be a global leader in that. There is absolutely a missed opportunity here. Mm. Is it really hard to have a conservative government, uh, and I'm not necessarily making a political allegiance here to any political party, but a, 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 a government that has sort of announced and detracted uh, retracted and announced and detra and retracted on 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 popularism that's absolutely very difficult for business planning mm -hmm. and 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 people planning and um and that's very challenging but it has been a very challenging few years so can we give them a break probably not 
Um, I I think that the government needs to be more stable in their um, approach to carbon. I think a carbon needs to go on the same time frames as things like defence. Okay, they are not actually part of government that's in power at that time. I think carbon needs to go on the longer term um, uh, thinking and strategy yeah. of 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 a, of a government's uh, um, systems and frameworks. And I think then we can have long term systems thinking towards um, carbon and economy um that that is actually more robust for for that government society and 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 if we can if all governments can do that then then collectively society benefits but one of the things i really am very passionate about one of them <laughs> <laughs> um uh, apart from uh, surfing and climbing um is um is the fact that i'm i'm just i'm fed up with this green versus growth thing it's <laughs> an absolute farce and and actually, the the government, whichever one it is, needs to recognise that it's both, and and there there's a real opportunity. And I yeah. think the rhetoric around that being one or the other is 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 a broken system. Adapt and adaptivate plays in where green and growth is one and the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, and and that's the thing, isn't it? That you're living and breathing it, and the there isn't much of an argument against that you know there's, there's loads of arguments against where there isn't the detail behind something or the facts and figures behind it or the visibility sure. behind it but when somebody's sure. living and breathing it and doing it it is very difficult to say that that thing that you're doing right now is impossible what the thing that i'm doing <laughs> is impossible why mm. am i doing it then um yeah and yeah that's 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 why we all love you, Tom, because um, <laughs> you, you, you're actually doing it. Um, well, and I think, look, yeah. we, we, we need to find more examples and, and there are out there and, um, you know, strength comes in numbers and we are greater than mm. some of our parts. And, and I, I, we haven't got a silver bullet here, Peter, as you know, you know, Adaptivate yeah. is not the solution. Uh, I think when I set this up, um, you know, I really just want to be to create an example, the business to be create an example of how a builder can go and build a business that can be a business of the future in a tough foundation industry that can create impact as its main metric and economic pro profit as a byproduct of that. Inspired by that surfer that went and built Patagonia, you know, uh, Yvonne Chouinard that did it in the clothing industry. Can we do that on the foundation industries? Because they are the main contributor to um, our CO2 emissions. They are the main contributor to GDP. And the, there is a massive skills gap. It's not a sexy industry mm. to be in, you know. And 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 really, I want to champion that, you know, that bringing together. That's why we're part of, you know, funded by the government. And, you know, and we've been part of the foundation industries, um, um, you know, funding call. Uh, really interesting meetings with government and academia and, and foundation industry leaders in cement, steel, glass, whatever, you know, plasterboard. You know, we've got to come together and get more examples into the real world. That's, you know, that's what we've got to yeah. do. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's important to to point out that, uh, you know, where where you, you started, we alluded to it in, in the intro, but you, you started in like a, a shed, basically basically uh and, only a and year ago own... mate. unit 10 <laughs> and, and, and that's what ago. i mean it, it, it it's it, it's not just a you set up this company and you've got a huge manufacturing facility and there's 50 people in the organization and you're churning out products left right and center and it's all done and dusted you know this is this is heart and soul foundational build it from the ground up stuff uh, yeah. and and that's what makes it a fantastic case study and, and an important one at that uh, as as um, as an example of what can be done. But with, with that in, in mind, let's take this builder that decided to do something in a shed um, sure. in an unsexy industry and, and talk a bit about the, the future. So on the podcast, we like disruption and we like talking about it and innovations that come through. 
and there's there's loads from biodiversity to smart buildings and low carbon or carbon negative materials so all that being said what is exciting you in emerging emerging trends in low carbon right now um what what excites me is having conversations uh with those bigger organizations that can see they've got a part to play and they can use their strength and the strength of businesses like at the stage that we're at that have proven mm. it out and have got to kind of pilot stage and a kind of commercial within the th you know three years if they get the right capital and and potentially and potentially partnerships but when it's those it's those partnerships that really inspire me and i think there's there's um because because that's where we can have real impact mm. um i think it's really really difficult for businesses like us to get access to the tens and hundreds of millions that are going to be needed to scale this in the time that we need. Now, I would mm -hmm. love to reel off a load of examples of, of businesses that have done that. And there are a few in yeah. you know, carb, carb fix are doing really well. They're not in the construction industry per se. They're in the, you know, they take CO2 and they squirrel it under the ground in, 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 um, in Iceland. Um, there's some great companies in the States that are getting access to quite a bit of capital uh, in the construction industry. Um, but, you know, here in Europe, we, we, we struggle with that access to capital um, for some reason. I think it possibly is because we're a bit more conservative on valuation. So therefore, it's harder to get the capital in for this hard okay. for this hardware, big industrial process stuff. While it's being pri uh, privately listed companies, different for publicly listed companies. But um, yeah, I think um, but there's there's loads of cool stuff, you know, like. Um, you know, to, to kind of name check some friends that are, are in the industry, you know, Indie Nature up in Scotland, you know, uh, natural fiber insulation, got a mill going, they're, they're, they're getting it into the market, you know, that's awesome. Yeah. My core, you know, my mycelium, myco based uh, insulation, um, you know, how, how do we how do we scale those things? Um, you know, uh, I love Concrete for Change and Sid, what Sid Porfell is doing at, at Concrete Creek for Change. You've got low carbon, low carbon materials. You've got, there's loads, there's loads and loads. Solida, you know, there's loads, Ecoloft. There's loads of people that are doing great, great things. And that's just the, the ones that come off my head, off the top of my head. Um, that's super inspiring. What I think is, though, if I'm looking at it from a how do we really make this happen, we need to get access to the kind of capital that um, the government and Tata Steel have just put into the, the plant down in, in South Wales, which is 500 million to go from, um, you know, old steel making to electric arc steel making. Mm. And we'll need that sort of that sort of money if we're going to go and really put a dent in carbon in the construction sector. Um so what's the best way of doing that? And let's get creative with humans that sit in bigger organizations and smaller organizations to make something work. Impact yeah. first, profit, profit as a byproduct. <laughs> For sure. I'm glad you mentioned uh, my core. I've got um, Olivia coming on the, the podcast um, in a few episodes, episode 22, I think, of which this is going to be episode 20. So although we're going to have uh, Christmas in between, of which we'll have a week's break, it's it's in a in a couple of weeks' time, which is which is pretty cool. Um, yeah, so that's great. Good, good, good plug there. Thanks, Tom. <laughs> there's uh, there's loads of them, mate, isn't there? I mean, you know, you get around the industry and see all the, you know, you're curious, um, you know, and, and energetic and you, you see them, you know, you, you could reel off a load more names of in the industry um yeah, it's sure. it's power you know power and strength in numbers eh? yeah yeah it always is collaboration is, is is key and um stay staying curious i think like you keep saying it's absolutely number one test test and fail but fail quickly that's the that's yeah, the yeah. key um tom i'm, I'm gonna wrap this up now uh because 
if I don't, we're going to end up chatting and it's going to be like beer time or something like that. So it is um, Friday. Gonna have, <laughs> gonna, <laughs> gonna have to wrap it up. So Tom, thank you so much for coming out. It's been an absolute uh, pleasure talking to you. You've just got a, a wonderful way with words, particularly when you're talking about the planet and us as humans and the way you describe that is fantastic. So once again, thank you so much for coming on. No, thank you, and thanks for your your for inviting me on, and for us to uh, to speak uh, about Adaptivate. And I just want to say thanks to you, mate, because from the moment that I met you uh, at our, our Breathe the Plaster launch event back in March at, at Unit Ten at HQ, um, your energy is infectious. Uh, yeah. You do something, you do it differently, and I I really am inspired by that. And and I know your listeners and the people that that, that see your content and. And, and have the privilege of, absorb, of absorbing that energy also benefit from it. So thank you ever so much and, and gratitude to you. Oh, pleasure. Cheers, Tom. Thank you so much. Yeah, likewise, mate.